Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and things to come when we hear about them. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Um, and... I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, and, Beatle peoples. And I should also mention a co-host of Talk More Talk, another Beatles podcast, a video podcast about the solo right. Beatles. Um, and Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area since 1983. Um, if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. How's it going? It's going, and when you push it, it goes. And it's great to be on board for another show. <laughs> Well, if you don't keep falling out of bed, we can... <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Just, another like, injury. You know, another another on another the... Another uh, injury. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well. For those of you who would keep... For those of you keeping score and keeping track of these things at home, let's see. I fell down the stairs and destroyed my left knee in 2013. And then I fell down the stairs and destroyed my right knee in 2019. And now the other day... I roll out of bed and jam my shoulder. So now I, I have like one good arm and one like dinosaur claw that I can't lift up because <laughs> I did some sort of strange damage to it. So I'm um, at the moment now sitting here wrapped in bubble wrap just in case, you know, I could tip over and fall off the chair uh, while we're doing the show. Uh, I won't get hurt. So that's, that's the latest on uh, me and my injuries. So, mm -hmm. so and on Facebook, I sent I sent Darren the, uh, the yes. video of the Black Knight from uh, <laughs> Mighty Python of the Holy Grail just to cheer him up. Oh, that's yeah, that's, yeah, pretty soon that's going to be me. I'm going to be like a, I'm going to be a, a, um, I'm going to be a, a torso on a stick with someone carrying me around. It's just a flesh wound. That's right. <laughs> so in the meantime, there's. Um, me and Ken, plus from the disabled players list, Darren, and we have a special guest today who's joined us before, David Bedford, uh, the fairly prolific author at this point of books about the Beatles and uh, different aspects of the Beatles. And we're going to be talking to him about his new one, The Country of Liverpool, Nashville of the North, about the... Uh, impact of country music in England and particularly Liverpool. Uh, welcome, David. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, like most people, I've uh, been absolutely nowhere, <laughs> apart from the, the, the inside of different rooms in my house, which is very exciting. So, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, I'm good. So apart from, you know, having you on periodically to talk about your books, we just like having a Liverpool accent on the show now and then, you know, just for verisimilitude. So, I, 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 so I'll just read the newspaper or something, but whatever works for you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're giving us credibility, David. Yeah. Oh, look, Ben, you must be desperate. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are. Yeah. We are the Fab Four today, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, and as always, before we um, get on to the main part of the show and our chat with David, uh, Ken has some news for us. Thank you, Alan. Okay, we'll start with uh, more news that's been developing on the Plastic Auto Band box set. First of all, a new video has been made for John's song Love from the album, and it premiered on YouTube appropriately on Valentine's Day. It features a collage of alternate takes and mixes of the recording taken from the box set, along with transcriptions of quotes from John and Yoko throughout the song. March 4th is the date when the official announcement is supposed to be on the new Plastic on All Band website, but the official John Lennon Facebook page is saying that the box set will have 159 new mixes. They're saying Stereo 5.1 and Dolby Atmos for two Blu-ray HD audio discs and will also be on six CDs. Plus, there'll be a 130-page hardback book. And 
bestclassicbands.com is reporting that the release for the box set will be April 16th. This is the first time that I've heard an official date for it. And keep in mind, this is only one source, bestclassicbands.com, for that. So we're only two months away from that. Hmm. Kind of peculiar right. having them you know, make a big deal about the date in which the date is going to be announced. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody sort of knows about this box set by now, you know, something about it. So to have a, a, a date for the press release, that's something new. <laughs> mm. It's kind of like announcing a date for, for like a making of video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, a new book is coming out in August called Paul McCartney, The Stories Behind 50 Classic Songs, 1970 to 2020 by Mike Evans. It's an in-depth look behind 50 of Paul's classic songs after the Beatles. The book includes session details, personnel lists, and chart data, from original inspiration to its final release. Quotes from uh, session musicians and studio personnel and guest stars Stevie Wonder, Elvis Costello, and Kanye West bring every song to life, including related photographs in and out of the studio. It is due out August the 5th. Also in August, another book is due out called Like Some Forgotten Dream, What If the Beatles Hadn't Split Up by Daniel Rachel. This music author takes a serious look at a playful question of pop history, what if the Beatles had made one more album? Rachel examines the missed opportunities and misunderstandings that led to the Fab Four's demise and from the ashes compiles a track list for an imagined final album. Based on years of research and strict criteria, Rachel suggests a thrilling alternative ending to the Beatles' legacy. The release date for this one is August the 26th, thanks to John Bazzini from the Beatles in Print, Together and Solo Facebook page for this information on these two books that I just mentioned. More news. Mary McCartney now has a new cooking show that just premiered on the Discovery Plus channel. Her new series, Mary McCartney Serves It Up, just launched on their channel on February the 4th. Mary, just like Mother Linda, has become a passionate vegetarian cook and has now written several vegetarian cookbooks and loves to entertain and cook for her friends and family. Her show not only will introduce you to her own recipes, but she'll be inviting famous friends to the show like Kate Hudson, Nicole Ritchie, Cameron Diaz, and Gail King. For more information, you can visit their website, discoveryplus.com. That's discovery, the word plus, P-L-U-S, dot com. Uh, Mary's so, not going to have you on, Ken? No, she hasn't invited me. Okay. Well, How about you, Alan? Nope. Well, I'm expecting <laughs> David first. I do, I do a great um, vegetarian peanut butter and jelly sandwich, actually. They really should have me. And do you I cook, think, David? I, I've never cooked David, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different show. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not bad. It's interesting in our household because of the four of us here have got two of my daughters still live at home. One who's vegetarian, the youngest one is vegan. Um, so we're trying to come up with, with meal plans. <laughs> um, for the four of us here is very, very interesting indeed, and, and a challenge. <laughs> ah, do they try to uh, pressure you to change your lifestyle there? Surely they wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm being very non-committal and diplomatic there. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, they're, they're not too in your face. They're, they're very good. We've allowed them, obviously, you know, to take their their choices. I mean, <laughs> daughter became vegetarian when she was fourteen. She's 27 now, uh, whereas the youngest daughter who is, is now vegan has only been vegan for a couple of years. Um, so. so this mm. is a show for them. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, if I did a cooking show, it would be opening a tin of beans and doing toast with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll have I mean, to, I'll have to teach it. you my peanut butter sandwich. It's really easy. <laughs> oh, no, I do that. I, I do a PBJ. I must admit, one of my favorites. Mm. I made rice the other night, and we lived, and we lived to tell about it. <laughs> I, so I do got... a very popular uh, Scottish dish as well. Oh, yeah, it's called okay. McDonald's. 
Ah, you asked. <laughs> what do you expect? You getting a scouser on? What do you expect? <laughs> it, pretty much that. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just a few more news items here, although I don't have all the details. We like to mention new cover versions of Beatle and solo Beatle material. And there is a new cover version just recorded of Silly Love Songs. And it comes from the great vocal duo, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., known best for their years in the fifth dimension. And back in the 70s, they had a, a mega hit, You Don't Have to Be a Star. You can listen to this new version on YouTube, but I checked and I can't find any more information if there's a new album coming out from the two, but they have recorded a new version of Silly Love Songs. We have a couple of passings to mention here. First of all, the death of Mary Wilson, one of the members of the Supremes. In the 60s, they were the top-selling female group with 12 number one hits in the U.S., and they were certainly primary competition to the Beatles, when it came to the singles charts in 1964, they released an album called A Bit of Liverpool, which had the trio recording songs from British invasion artists, not just the Beatles, but the Beatles songs they covered were A Hard Day's Night, You Can't Do That, Can't Buy Me Love, and I Want to Hold Your Hand. They also recorded A World Without Love, which Paul wrote and gave to Peter and Gordon, and even How Do You Do It? which the Beatles recorded, yet because they didn't want to make it their first single, was given to Jerry and the Pacemakers. The Supremes also performed eight days a week on the TV shows Shindig and Hullabaloo. Mary Wilson died in her sleep on February the 8th at the age of 76. And we send condolences out to Gary Burr after learning that his older brother Rick has died from COVID. Gary, we know from being a member of Ringo's Roundheads and along with Mark Hudson and Steve Dudas, played and wrote many songs for Ringo on those albums that Mark co-produced with Ringo. And Gary went on and still continued to work with Ringo, co-writing songs with him on uh, subsequent albums. So again, condolences to Gary Burr and his family. All right. I did say that the news is brief, the early part of the year. And that's all I got for now. Okay, so we will now all turn our attention to David, having heard already about his cooking skills. Uh, last time you were on here, I believe it was to talk about um, you know finding the fourth Beatle or you know the, uh, about the Beatles drummers and um, all the research you had done on that. I think it was before the book actually came out, so that was in progress. I believe that was the book before this one, or was there something in between? Yeah, that that was the uh, the book before uh, before this one, yeah. Okay. Now, this one, um, you know, I think we all know that the Beatles had a thing for what we now call rockabilly and, you know, Carl Perkins and, uh, you know, a lot of the things that they covered. Um, But it never had occurred to me that there was enough material for a book about the influence of country music in England. And uh, so this was sort of an interesting surprise. Uh, what, what led you on to this? Well, it was about three years ago, I was introduced to a guy called Phil Brady. And Phil had formed his first country group in 1962. He ended up touring with you know, the biggest names in country music, became the number one country artist in the UK. And I was talking to him after being introduced one evening and he was, you know, just some, tell me some of the stories from his career. But he said he's kept all the memorabilia, so newspaper cuttings, flyers, tickets, photographs, all kinds of stuff for his, his whole career. So he said, if you want, come round to the house. So I said, OK, so I pop round and he had a small suitcase, Do you know, like a flight case you take on the airplane with you. Mm-hmm back in the days when we used to fly places. Um, <laughs> and it, he had one of those, and it was just full of all this memorabilia. Now, if you're an obsessive historian like I am, I mean, that that was just gold. It was just amazing to look at this. And so basically what he wanted me to do was to do his biography, to tell his story. Now, I'd known that Liverpool had the reputation in the 60s of being called the Nashville of the North. 
because we have the biggest country and western scene, certainly in the UK, probably in Europe, it has to be said. Um, so I knew, I knew there was a big country scene there anyway. So I said to Phil, OK, so we'll get the background, get his story of growing up, how he was exposed to, to country music and looking at the context. And so once I started digging, I knew of the, the, the major artists, um, along with Phil, who was Kenny Johnson with the Hillsiders and Hank Walters and the Dusty Road Ramblers. But then the more I sort of looked into it, realised there was well over 100 country artists in Liverpool. But the interesting thing was this was at exactly the same time as the Beatles and of Merseybeat, and they were going alongside each other. So I thought, so, well, I've got to get the context for it. And the context really starts in the, the 40s. Mm-hmm. And then once I was realising and thinking, well, hang on, I know we know, you know that Ringo was the big country fan, you know, and they, they did act naturally, what goes on. He thought, well, there's a couple of token country songs and that's that. And then thinking, well, hang on, the, at the same time, country was, was starting to grow in Liverpool. That's when Skiffle was happening. And when you start digging more into Skiffle, you realise, well, well the, the roots of Skiffle, which, of course, was, was the Quarrymen, the roots of that are in are really in American folk and bluegrass. Mm-hmm. And like there's American Railroad songs that Lonnie Donegan was making famous. That I had this suddenly that this this moment when I found a very early Quarrymen business card, and that's one that's on the, the front of the book, mm-hmm. and it has the Quarrymen in the middle, and at the top of the music that they play it says country western rock and roll skiffle. And I thought I hadn't noticed that before. Mm-hmm. I'd had conversations, and in fact it was when when we were filming the Looking for Lennon documentary that I, I worked on, and Rod Davis from the Quarrymen was saying, well, we learnt our three chords for Skiffle. Then we realised, well, those, those same three chords played country, right. and the same three chords played rock and roll. And blues. But there's more of a story than just telling Phil Brady's story. To tell the context, the Quarrymen and the Beatles are coming into it more and more. Mm-hmm. Okay. How much of I mean, how much of the Quarrymen's early set list would have been country tunes? Do you think? Um, there's quite a lot. I've um, what, what I've done is I've tried to go through set lists, talking to members of the Quarrymen, um, so I've got to know them well over the years, and just looking at a, a lot of the songs that they were playing. And I mean, one of the first things you find if you go up to somebody and say, "Define country music for me," it's virtually impossible. Yeah, because it, there's so many genres within genres and stuff. So a lot of what Skiffle was and the way it was being played was very close to, to, to roots, country and bluegrass. So a lot of the songs they were playing, you would say were country songs. Um, some of them out and out because even when they, they were covering people like Elvis, you know, because when Elvis Presley started out, um, he was nicknamed the Hillbilly Cat. Right. So... There was a country feel to a lot of the artists they were copying. You know, Buddy Holly got roots in country. Carl mm-hmm. Perkins, you know, we were talking about Hillbilly. Uh, the Everly Brothers. You know, all these artists they were covering all have their roots in country music. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the repertoire, when you're trying to say, well, what actually is Skiffle? Well, most of Skiffle is country. Right. So majority of the songs, they're either doing country songs, doing the, the rockabilly, Carl Perkins stuff, and then a bit of rock and roll was sneaking in as well. But the, the lines were blurred. And this is one of the things I found, like when I was talking to Phil Brady, and the more people I spoke to at the Mersey Beat scene was, you didn't have a separation of, well, this club, you only have rock and roll. This club is country only. You'd have a couple of those. But most of the time, when you'd have a number of bands appearing um, at a venue, you would have a mixture of beat groups and country groups, and there'd be a crossover of, of the songs where a country group would do, even like some of the Chuck Berry songs, in a slightly more country style, whereas the beat group would do it a bit more rock and roll mm-hmm. So th- there was no very, very clear separation between the genres. There was a lot of crossover between them, and it was only sort of really after the Beatles made it and Mersey Beat sort of became a thing. I think probably one of the most high-profile Things was Kenny Johnson had a group called uh, Sonny Webb and the Cascades, and 
they were doing this mixture of uh, rock and roll and, and country. But Kenny Johnson was saying, you know, his, he really wanted to do country music. And so they decided, I think, in 63, said, we're not going to go down the beat route like all the other groups were doing. Said that there's enough Mersey beat groups doing this. We're going to do country. And so they became the Hillsiders and became a country group. And they became the most successful group to come out of Liverpool. Um, again, a top UK actor recorded out in Nashville. Um, huge, huge stars. So it was that interesting thing of there was an overlap, but there was no very clear definition that separated the groups. It's interesting because, um, you know, having grown up in New York, um, we looked at country music as entirely rural and alien to our experience of life. Yeah. And, it, you know, and, you know, it, it, it took a while later to sort of realize it. Well, wait a minute, you know, some of the stuff the Beatles are doing actually has country roots. But but even so, we, we sort of embraced it more as, as a, a in its rock manifestation so i'm wondering you know we're at least in the same country as country what what <laughs> would the appeal of rural american music be to english people you know it, it seems even more well it is literally foreign but it seems even more distant what was it about country music that appealed so much to people over there um well it's interesting you say that it would be completely foreign because it wasn't completely foreign because if you go back to the roots of country music and you really go back to, to the Appalachians and the Appalachian music, mm -hmm. well, the roots of the Appalachian music was in British folk songs. So a lot of the, the songs that came over um, after the Pilgrim Fathers were original British folk songs. And particularly um, there was the Scottish and the Irish folk songs that were carried across to America and they found themselves in the Appalachian Mountains and that's what came down and when country was sort of getting discovered in the 1920s a lot of the songs they were singing were original British songs and so they weren't as foreign as maybe you'd think because yeah. actually the, the beginnings of American country music um, were actually um, over in the UK so there was the appeal because folk music even though it's progressing became country music over there, we're mm -hmm. still doing a similar thing over this side. So then you have to look at, at Liverpool. I think, well, why Liverpool? And it's that great thing with the Beatles. You think, well, when you look at, at Liverpool through the 20th century, the American influence here was, was huge. So because we had the transatlantic ships going from the mid-19th century, those first transatlantic um, trips were from Liverpool to New York and back again. So we had the, these people who we called the Cunard Yanks, mm -hmm. and they were people like Alf Lennon, John's dad, like George's dad, Harry, had been on the White Star Line. They were stewards. They were the engineers. They were the people who worked on the merchant vessels traveling from Liverpool to New York. They'd have a few days in New York, and they'd go and buy records, and then they'd bring them back here and they passed them out to you know whoever friends and relatives so the people in liverpool were hearing all kinds of this, jazz music r&b um, but majority of it was country music you had bits of jazz in there as well mm -hmm. so all these records were coming into liverpool uh, in the 1940s and 50s before they were available on any uk release so all this american music was coming in but we had these Cunard Yanks as well that were bringing American culture with them. So they'd come back, you know, with the suits, the cameras, the, the cigars, their aftershave, the comics. Plus, then, of course, the music that the Beatles and that whole generation were listening to was Radio Luxembourg and mm. Armed Forces Network, which is full of American music. So that's, they were listening to American DJs playing American music. And then at the same time, because just outside of Liverpool, there was a U.S. airbase called Burton Wood, which um, was taken over in 1942. At its peak, there was nearly 20,000 U.S. servicemen there. Mm -hmm. 
when they had their downtime, they came to Liverpool. So you'd be bumping into Americans in Liverpool. So, the, you know, the, the, the kids were obsessed, they were obsessed with, with the comics. And one of the interesting chapters in the book, I was speaking to a guy from Manchester who was doing research, and, and this guy, Gary, was looking at what television shows and movies were the Beatles generation looking at. And the work he's done, it was like the, the cowboy films, which they go and see on a Saturday morning, and the TV westerns on the television, all American culture. And that's why, of course, you had the, the, the singing cowboys on there, of course, you know, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers. So you had all this American culture in Liverpool, and it's just been one of these attitudes of Liverpool just happens to be in England, which happens to be in the UK. We, mm-hmm. we almost see ourselves as our own country, and we look more across the Atlantic to you guys than we do down to London. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, I'll pass you over to Ken. David, you, you kind of answered my first question because I wanted to know how young people were discovering this country music on the radio, and you mentioned Radio um, Luxembourg. Yeah. Um, how much country music was played on there? Did they rely on how much was on the BBC? I know the BBC is very limiting in what they can play, but um, were they a factor at all in influencing uh, the youth there when it came to country and Western music? Uh, no, the, the BBC, the closest they got was um, the light program. You wouldn't get rock and roll on there. You'd get a bit of jazz. You'd get a little bit of country, but you wouldn't get much else. Most of the country music they were listening to You'd have Radio Luxembourg, and they'd have the various chart shows. So that'd be more, you know, whatever the current stuff was. But one of the big things was AFN, the Armed Forces Network, mm. which, of course, was broadcasting to the U.S. troops who were still stationed in Europe after the Second World War. And because that was aimed at the American troops, a lot of that would be country music as well as other forms as well. So I know that, for instance, John Lennon, he got introduced to Elvis Presley because a school friend of his, Don Beatty, had heard Elvis on AFN. Now, they were picking this up very late at night. Same with Luxembourg. You could only pick it up, I think, like up to eight o'clock in the evening. Mm. And it, it was shortwave, so it, it would go in and out. But that's where you get a lot of it. the American music would be on there. So it, the BBC didn't cater really for any popular music of any distinction, really until they got into the 60s. It was, it, there was still just, it was the light program, that was all. So it was finding Radio Luxembourg, it was finding AFN, but everybody knew somebody who had a relative on the ships and were bringing these records back. And a m- number of people I've spoken to would say, and this is how Phil Brady got started, his friend's dad had got hold of some Hank Williams records. So whoever had the record player and the record, you went to their house and you listened, and mm. that, that's how that's how they uh, they discovered it. Now I know when it comes to the Beatles, they discovered a lot of American music just from going to NEMS and playing the music and listening with the headphones on, as opposed to getting it off the Liverpool port. Yeah, from sailors and everything. But it was different for other teenagers. You even mentioned in the book because of um, uh, Michael Hill that John Lennon really didn't own any records at all. He had like one single, which he believes he stole from Michael. So (laughs) when it comes to records for the Beatles themselves, I don't know how much they owned of the new music of the time. You know, they were exposed to other music, older music, as as we've learned, especially with Paul's background, with the family being, you know, being musicians, his father in particular. But um, in general, so... For most teenagers in Liverpool, they got to know about country music from a combination of the sailors coming in, bringing the records, and from Radio Luxembourg and the American Forces Network. Yeah, and then it will be people. So, like, like for example, you, you know, you mentioned Michael Hill. So, from the, the gang of four, as they were, which was John Lennon, Pete Shotton, Michael Hill, and Don Beatty, Michael was the guy who was doing... Uh, paper round and stuff so he was earning the pocket money he was then buying the records so so as i mean as we know john was allergic to any kind of work 
So, <laughs> and, and Pete was exactly the same as him. So you would have probably one friend, maybe two, in your group of friends who was buying the records. And what you would do is, when you bought a record, you would go to their house. So what, and this is how John discovered Little Richard you know, and Long, Long Tall Sally, because Michael bought Long Tall Sally on a school trip to Amsterdam and said to John, you know, here's a guy who's better than Elvis, played the record to John, and John said, I couldn't speak, it was so great. That was the music that took him to the rest of the world. That's because John, Pete, and Don would go to Michael's house. Now, and, and of course, when I, I speak to Michael, you know, he had a number of Hank Williams records, and John absolutely loved Hank Williams. Mm. And, and that seems to be the common theme in Liverpool. Uh, and this is the same for Merseybeat musicians as for anybody else. And I was talking to Billy J. Kramer the other night, and he was exactly the same. You know, Hank Williams was the one who got everybody started. And it's funny, I don't know if you've ever listened to it, but uh, Move It On Over by Hank sure. Williams. Uh-huh. Okay, So that, that's rock around the clock. You know, it, it's, it's the same melody. Mm. So you, you listen to that, and, and that comes up, what, late 40s, Move It On Over. Mm-hmm. Rock Around the Clock is sort of the song that kickstarts rock and roll over here for us, but that is just lifted from from the Hank Williams song. And you know, Rock Around the Clock still has a country vibe to it more more than rock and roll, but it has rock in the title, doesn't it? Yeah. So Hank Williams, and this is why I went back and I just listened to lots of Hank Williams songs, and you can hear there is the birth of rock and roll within what Hank Williams was doing. It wasn't the country and Western, which is different to, to country music. And you can hear the basics of where rock and roll came from when you listen to a lot of Hank Williams stuff that Hank was doing in, in the, uh, the 1940s. Mm. So you could see why that would appeal to someone like John Lennon. You know, and he loved listening to that. And they all did. They all enjoyed listening to those records. So it, it was that combination. It's almost like it's the perfect storm. You've got this all this American music coming over to a city that's obsessed with everything American, with all the culture, with everything that goes with it, they were soaking it up. Yeah. You know, as we know, both John and Ringo at different times were looking to, to go to America. You know, Ringo wanted to emigrate. John mm-hmm. was looking at joining the Merchant Navy. And one of those main reasons would be to do the same trip that his dad would have done, which was to go across from Liverpool to New York. So... American culture was everywhere. So, yeah, the record shops, we mentioned NEMS, but when you go back to, like, the, the, the telephone directories and the street directories, there were so many record stores in Liverpool. So you would have specialist country and Western record stores, but you'd have the majority of them would cater for everything. You know, because the reason the Cavern was so successful was because it was one of the biggest jazz clubs in the country. So jazz was huge in Liverpool which, of course, mm-hmm. then we, we get skiffle from that. So all these different music forms were here. And it was all, it was the American culture. It was exciting. I think it was, I think it's when I was talking to, to Colin Hanson from The Quarrymen, um, and a couple of others have said it, you know, up until they start hearing this amazing music that was coming out of America, most of the world was sort of in black and white. You know, post-war Liverpool was, was not an exciting place to be, mm. you know. We, it, the city had been battered. It really had. But suddenly everything came in technicolor. Hmm. And all this exciting music came. And suddenly, I mean, Colin's little rebellion was you couldn't be seen by your parents to dress differently. He bought a pair of, of uh, fluorescent socks. <laughs> so most people couldn't see them, but he knew he was rebelling, <laughs> which is great. And like, likewise with the Beatles, when they went to Hamburg, they, they wore our cowboy boots. Exactly. You know, you, you look at, the, um, as I've done with, with various photos of the Beatles, you know, you look at that that early one of them with the, the white jackets and the bootlace ties, mm. you know, that that's straight out, out of the, the country films. You know, you look at Rory Storm, the Hurricanes, you know, they were taking stage names and they were taking them from cowboy films. You know, mm-hmm. the, the search has completely lifted their, their group name from that. You know, we look back at, at a popular comic over here, it was... Um, the Ringo Kid. Yes. Um, so, and these were all American comics, which you could get over here. You know, so Saturday mornings would be, go to whichever of, of the local cinemas, and you watch the cowboy films. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, everything was there. It was exciting. It was different. It was like, you know, that's the promised land was America. Mm-hmm. That's and why Ringo, they were so excited when they made it. <laughs> Ringo got his name from the character of Johnny Ringo. There you go. So, yeah, exactly. So you've got Johnny Ringo and, you know, you had also Ty Bryan, Johnny Guitar. You know, all these guys, oh. they, they were taking the, these personas from the Cowboys. Um, mm-hmm. And, of course, in the past, you know, as I point out in the book, you know, people like uh, Buffalo Bill had visited Liverpool. Roy Rogers, of course, came here mm-hmm. with Trigger, who rode and the horse went up the steps of the Delphi Hotel. You know, Gene Autry <laughs> played here. So, you know, there was so much American influence here. But, of course, Liverpool has a very big Irish influence as well. And going back to the point I was saying before about the roots of American country, a lot of that goes back to Irish folk music. Mm. So, of course, a lot of that was in Liverpool. And the reason I think country became so popular was that it was acoustic and it was very, very prominent with the working class in the pubs. And still today, you know, you go to certain pubs in Liverpool, somebody will have an acoustic guitar and they'll just start playing and everybody will sing along going back to you know the 40s to the 60s in particular that was happening in pubs all throughout liverpool it was acoustic stuff so there'd be folk music but and there'd be irish traditional irish songs as well but you'd have a lot of that would be country music and that again is why it was so popular in liverpool that whole idea of communal singing and that i think as you mentioned before that's what particularly paul mccartney was exposed to with his family, with a lot of the Irish influences there, the yeah. family gatherings around the piano, everybody had a song they had to sing. So that was what was being generated in the city. And this is why it influenced this whole generation. And some of them went on to do beat music. Some of them stuck with their, their country music. And a lot of them did a mixture of the two. And that's when I started looking beyond act naturally and what goes on. Is there a country influence in the Beatles music itself? And you, you suddenly realize, I, I think I've made a list, it's about, it's about 25 songs that they recorded throughout their, you know, the, the 60s recording career as the Beatles, which are mm-hmm. country songs or songs with country roots. You suddenly realize how important it is. You know, wasn't it John who said the Beatles for Sale was their country western album? Right. Or crumbly and western, as John called it. <laughs> <laughs> it was typical John. So that influence was there right the way through the Beatles' career. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I was growing up hearing a lot of their early stuff, especially a song like Can't Buy Me Love, to me, that's that's just rock and roll to me. Yeah. And then later on, you hear people say, well, had a country and western influence. And I never really thought about it all that much. Yeah. You know, but you listen to the lead guitar solo and yeah, you could hear it, you know, in that context. The same thing with All My Lovin'. I never thought had a country and Western feel or vibe to it. And once you start thinking that way, yeah, you can hear it that way. So that's very interesting. Have you found in, in your research that there were any British country artists like Phil Brady that was an influence on the Beatles? Or was everything strictly the American country artist? Um, the, the person I think who influenced a lot of uh, the Beatles as well as um, a lot of the other Merseybeat groups was Hank Walters. Now, Hank Walters was probably the first country, country western star in Liverpool. So he was sort of late 40s, about 1947. And, and you know, he was performing. Um, he, he sadly only died a matter of months ago. Oh. Um, but he, he performed for years and years. And he was traditional country, you know, he wouldn't have a drum kit in his group. Now, stayed with the acoustic acoustic stuff. Um, he played accordion as well. He never turned professional. He still worked as a docker all his life and then performed in the evenings. And he was the guy who started the first country club called the Black Cat. And it was in the same building uh, where the Beatles played, which the uh, the Casanova Club in London Road. So on different floors, on one floor you'd have the country club and then the next floor up you got the rock and roll club. And there were certainly uh, times when I think particularly it was a, an exchange between John Lennon and, and Hank 
And Hank Walter was, was trying to say to John, forget that rock and roll, you should be doing country. And John decided, no, you know, they were going to do their thing. But so Hank Walters was a big influence on the whole of the country scene. And so it's, it's the two Hanks, really, that people looked to was, was Hank Williams to start with and locally Hank Walters. And he, he certainly was very, very prominent at the time. The Beatles and their counterparts of what became the Mersey Beat groups. Hank was the star. Did you ever come across any interview where any of the Beatles mention Hank Walters? Uh, yes, yeah, there was an, in, an, interview, an exchange uh, between John and, and Hank Walters, and, that, and they have that little that little discussion mm-hmm. about sticking to country music and, and doing the, the rock and roll, and Hank Walters would tell them to give all that off because country was much better. Um, and he was as, as opinionated as John was, um, <laughs> and, but they bounced off each other well. You know, it was a great, great character, it really was. Okay, let me pass you over to Darren. Darren, it's all very fascinating stuff, David. That uh, that you're talking about, and a couple of kind of random observations I've made. Bernie Taupin, Elton John's lyricist, has often talked about the influence that American country had on him as a boy growing up, um, seeing all the country and western programming on television, and yeah. I'd imagine the music as well. And that has always been a reoccurring theme in Elton John's music: is the American West. Um, yeah. you know, which which comes through on albums like Tumbleweed Connection, uh, the the reference uh, references to cowboys and Indians and uh, country music on um, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy uh, and the Captain and the Kid. Uh, something else that I noticed that there seems to be a, the there was a great appreciation and love for this musical. Uh, form that was big in America, and it uh, it's something that I've noticed through the years that it's almost as if here in the United States we don't quite appreciate some of the uh, music forms that not so much originated here, but maybe became popular here. It always seemed to me like when I would talk to jazz musicians that today they would have to go to Europe or to Japan to tour or yep. they would sell more product in those in, in those regions. And here in the United States, where they were from, they uh, were lucky that they were able to uh, get gigs at the smallest of clubs. And it sounds as though, you know, in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, the enthusiasm over in England, and I'm sure other parts of Europe, uh, for country music, maybe kind of uh, dwarfed the enthusiasm that we, we may have had. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that's similar for some of the rock and roll, you know, for Little Richard and Chuck Berry, especially. I think they found themselves more popular over here than they were back in the US. Um, right. And I think that, that influence was, was certainly probably more appreciated in places like Liverpool. You know, and the country scene wasn't just in Liverpool, it was the biggest. But if, basically, most of the major port cities. So you look, you go up to Glasgow, uh, you go across up to the northeast, Newcastle, Pontine, you go to, to Hull, down to London, across to Bristol. All the major port cities where these records and this culture would be coming in and out, country music was big. Uh, and at times it, it was bigger than the beat scene was. So mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's a real mixture. And yeah, it, it may be, it's the old thing that a prophet's never as accepted in his own country that maybe they had to come over here, you know, like Chuck Berry and Little Richard did. And, you know, the tours, like, like with Phil Brady, you know, the, the guys that he's back, Willie Nelson, when, before he was an outlaw, you know, we've got a picture of, of Phil Brady backing Willie Nelson, who's there in a, a beautiful white suit, short hair, clean shaven. <laughs> you know, before the outlaw that, that we all know, you know, Buck Owens, of course we know with the act naturally, Hank Snow, all the top, country artists came over here and toured around the UK and toured around Europe. You know, Phil got presented with an award for his, his contribution for the, being the, the best country artist in the UK, awarded by Roy Orbison. So, you know, these were the biggest names and they were massive over here. They really were. And yeah, that, that, may, that may be the problem because certainly I, I know like the story of Willie Nelson of find that Nashville wasn't the answer to everything. You know, that, that mm-hmm. wasn't it. And 
even though sort of, you know Chet Atkins had the Nashville sound, and it's, like we were saying, if you listen to the Beatles records, you have George Harrison with his two Gretsch guitars uh, that Chet Atkins would have, the tenor scene and the country gentleman, hence the country sound to a lot of George Harrison's guitar work. That sound was then rejected by people like Willie Nelson, who moved out of Nashville to try and find their own identity. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, no, I, I can see that definitely, that sometimes you have to leave where you think the heart of something is to go and find it. It, it seems to me that in, in, in Liverpool and in England that um, the different genres of music blended seamlessly and that people were open to going to a, a club and seeing a jazz band and then a country band and a skiffle band and maybe another country band. And those lines uh, between genres, in my opinion, always seem to be much more defined in the States uh, where, you know, everything is kind of ghettoized. Um, Mm. one one genre of music that we haven't mentioned here that is sort of that melting pot of of influences that rock and roll came out of and country was influenced, uh, was part of it, and there was a dash of uh, folk, was the blues. And we know that later in the 1960s, um, the huge British blues boom, that's not easy to say, British (laughs) blues boom, uh, towards the late 60s. I don't think there was something like that with country music over uh, something of that scale. But where did blues play in the whole 50s, early 60s scene as folks were getting turned on to American country and Western uh, and folk and Hank Williams, for example, was the blues in there as well? We know the Rolling Stones, for example, one example, they found it. But how prominent was American rhythm and blues also mixed in with the country and the folk and whatnot? Oh, very much a big part of it, because, again, if you go back uh, and just, for example, just look at uh, Hank Williams as sort of the major influencer. But you go all the way back to the very beginning um, to the Carter family, to Jimmy Rogers, their country music had an element of blues in there. Some of the country songs that were were recorded under the, the country genre. Or blues songs, so and that's why it's hard to define what country is, because mm. th- there are so many different types. So within country music, you'd have the rockabilly stuff with that crossover that Carl Perkins led the way in, but you had then blues as part of country music, which could be an element. You then have the jazz element, which is where you get country and western, because people think westerns from the western television shows. It's western swing. So it's when mm-hmm. you, you get the jazz influence into, into country, you get the country and Western. So you can get differences there. Then you've got bluegrass, which is really going back to very acoustic, a lot faster. So there's all these different styles. So blues was very much in there. Rhythm and blues, then again, was big. So some of the guys that the Beatles reference, Big Bill Brunsey, et cetera, you know, that was still an element of what was getting played here. Now, I think blues as a separate genre developed more in London than it ever did in Liverpool as a separate um, style of music. But within the country part of blues, that that was very much part of. um, And and because people weren't saying, right, I'll pick that song because it it fits in with this style, but I won't have that one. If it was a good song and we get people dancing or interested, they performed it. That's why you had the crossover. And it's so hard to define what is UK country? What is Mersey Beat? And when you get back to it, a lot of what Mersey Beat is and, and what the Beatles performed has its roots in those various forms of the country music scene in Liverpool. In your opinion, you, you mentioned that the, the blues really took root in London. And then I mentioned before the late 60s and the whole British blues boom. Even I say the late 60s, really, John Mayle was 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 uh, yeah. was was doing it from the early 60s why didn't country music really have that mainstream huge presence that the british blues movement ended up being i think because and funny enough I, I had a very very strange discussion with a guy who writes for the country music people magazine over here and it's a uk-based country magazine it's been going since the 60s 
and I was talking talking about the, the book and some other projects linked to it. And I could, we're starting work on a documentary film to tell the story of the country of Liverpool, um, as well as book number two with all the country artists. And he basically said to me, well, I don't really rate the Beatles. I thought, no, fair enough. Not everybody does. So, but I, I don't like the Stones, Dylan, uh, or any of those. And his conclusion was, and this is from a guy who, who edits a UK country music magazine. I don't really rate any UK country artists that have ever been, have ever existed. And basically for him, if it's country music, it has to be American. And I think that was the problem, was that you could get so far with country music. So because it was always seen as a form of American folk roots music, unless you did something different, if you were British, you could never have the same sort of authenticity as if you were American. And it always had that problem. But that's just from a chart point of view. Now, if you go outside of the, of the charts, country music has always been a huge, huge thing here. And the, the concluding chapter in the, back, in the book, when I talked to a guy, Dominic Halpin, he's been touring the UK with a country um, theatrical show for three years until uh, the pandemic, which has packed out theatres all across the UK and has been running constantly for the, for the last three years. So the music is always there, but it's been a bit more, bit more underground, but massively popular in the working class cities and particularly the port cities where it's always had a big following. Mm. All right. Alan, back to you. You know, one thing that struck me as we were talking about the things, the, the, the influence on the Beatles themselves is that um, in a way that comes through much more clearly in their BBC repertory than on their album repertory where, you know, on, on the albums, they did, did some things. They did some Carl Perkins and, and other things, but to me, the most, probably the most country, country sound the Beatles um, got was on the BBC recording of I Forgot to Remember to Forget. Um, yeah, and that, classic, yeah. Yeah, and then, they, you know, they also had Crying, Waiting, Hoping, Sure to Fall. I mean, if you listen to the BBC stuff, you get a much clearer idea of how much the country influence uh, was, was felt in their uh, development, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you, you can definitely see that. But if if you go through like like I've done with just picking um, their albums in chronological order, mm -hmm. you know, th there's stuff all the way through. Sure. Um, on on every album, we can say you know, you, you can see the country country influences there, not just in the songs they were covering, but you know, with some of their original mm -hmm. songs as well. Sure, things like what um, goes on and. Yeah, I mean, they're the obvious ones, but, um, you know, if, if you look at Beatles for Sale, mm -hmm. um, and obviously you're doing Honey, Don't So, you, you've got a, a cover song there, and that everyone, uh, everybody's trying to be my baby. But think of Babies in Black, I'll Follow the Sun, I'm a Loser. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to spoil the party. I mean, oh, yeah. oh I mean, did that, that, you, you can have yeah. a bit of hate down with that. That's true. Um, so... <laughs> You know, people just think of the obvious things like Act Naturally and the covers, but, you know, Another Girl, if you think of that, um, I've, I've just seen, seen a face. I mean, that's just the, the blend of, of skiffle and bluegrass. Mm -hmm. um, the Night Before, You Like Me Too Much, Tell Me What You See. You know, the, the, once you start going through, and, and like I did, it's going through each of the albums and listening for that influence, you know, it, it's more than just the style of how George is playing the country sounding guitar, you know, you can hear the influence of the artists they'd listened to when they were younger, but those other major artists like the Everly's, like, like Buddy Holly, um, as well as Carl Perkins, you, you can hear the country influence in the songs that they were recording. And it, it's funny when I was talking with Billy J. Kramer the other night, he said to me um, after he'd had a number of, of hits and he's about, you know, what, what do you do next? He said to Brian Epstein and George Martin, I want to do a country album because that influence was so big. And I mean, they just poo-pooed it and said, absolutely not. Yeah. You're going to keep doing this. But because that was very much part of their musical upbringing in Liverpool, and it was there. And once you start looking and going back 
just going through their albums, you, you can hear those influences in their songs. Mm-hmm. I hadn't really thought of a lot of the songs you mentioned quite that way, but um, I'll listen to them again and and see how that sounds. I think another another way you can hear their influence in a kind of roundabout, you know, doubly reinterpreted way is if you listen to a lot of the Beatles cover albums done by country oh, yeah. musicians, you know, Chet Atkins picks on the Beatles, the stuff sounds so natural oh, yeah. in Absolutely. his versions that I think maybe a, a lot of that, the, the roots of it comes through more clearly that, you know, they're, they're sort of hidden under a more rock and roll veneer on the Beatles albums, but the, the impulse comes through in, in those covers. Yeah, because it's, it's so easy to cover them mm-hmm. because, you know, that, that's where the roots are. So it, yeah, it, it's not too difficult then just to do a slightly different arrangement mm-hmm. uh, by a country artist because it, it's a country song at heart. Because, I mean, you know, obviously, as, as solo artists, both Ringo and Paul recorded in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And that was certainly country, what they were doing. Right, that must right. have, that is bound to have had an influence. You know, Buku's a Blues. Mm-hmm. That, that Ringo did, which is a great album. It, it really is one of my favorite Ringo albums. And it's a very, very good country album. And for him, the thrill of going to Nashville and recording there, you know, and it comes out in the recording. So, yeah, the, the Beatles, would, they would have been influenced. I think they would have to be if they had a recorded out there. Mm-hmm. Okay, Ken? Some... Uh... Some of the Beatles material, I have a tough time distinguishing whether I think it's country or really folk. You know, I mean, on yep. one hand, you could take a look at a song like Norwegian Wood and you can say, oh, well, yeah, maybe it's a little country. But to me, it's a folk song. But I can understand somebody hearing it a different way. I never heard You Like Me Too Much that way. But certainly, you know, obviously, Don't Pass Me By, oh, yeah. uh, Rocky Raccoon. And even if you listen to the very beginning of what George plays on lead on yeah. Octopus's Garden, Absolutely. that's very country. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's there. The, the influences are there. And again, when you say, like, like you say with Norwegian Wood, you know, is it folk? Is it country? Well, where's the dividing line? Mm. And it's very, very hard to say it's completely one or the other. It's one of those because of the style and the, the time signature that's in it. It's almost, you, you could feel country waltz, but you can still get, the, you can hear the folk element of that. Right. But in a way, country music, because it's, it's a, an umbrella term for so, so many genres, folk is part of that. Now, some it can go off and be very, obviously a lot of Bob Dylan, stuff, so very, very folk music and very different to, to country. But there's a lot of other stuff where, the folk and, and the country lines, are, again, are very, very blurred. And I think Norwegian Wood's a perfect example of that, yeah. where it, it can fit. It's, and that's the beauty of what the Beatles did, because you can't stick their music into a genre. And that's why I always get so fascinated with who and what influenced them. And it's only when you fully understand Liverpool before the Beatles can you get a true appreciation for the recording career of the Beatles? And you can't pigeonhole them. You know, at every album they were doing something different. Right. But but there were there, there were some constants through there. But you can't stick them into one genre because they covered so many, because the influences in Liverpool were so varied and they were so open to anything different that once they were recording and they were meeting more people, they were picking influences up from everywhere. And that, I, I think, is the beauty of listening to the, the Beatles songs, is you can't say, oh, well, that's, and that's that. It's, that that's, it's the Beatles m- mixture of all of that together, yep. uh, which is, is, is genius, which you can't define. Yeah. Now, musically, they're all over the place. They, yeah. they kind of conquered everything, even with avant-garde with Revolution Number no. 9. You know, yeah. I've said so many times there's never been a more diverse album, a more eclectic album than the than the White Album. Oh, completely. <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, you you, but, you try uh, and define that. <laughs> um, one name that I want to mention and I want to thank you for bringing him up is Hank Snow. Yeah. And I I didn't realize that um, at parties in Liverpool, 
Uh, Ringo said that his mother used to sing to him, Little Drummer Boy, yep. and he would sing back, Nobody's yep. Child. And always make her cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we know Nobody's Child because the Beatles did it with Tony Sheridan. And then, of course, the Traveling Wilburys did Wilburys, it. But, yeah. So, you know. That's why. Yeah, that, that, that's because that was always uh, the song, you know, Ringo would talk about, you know, sitting on his mum's knee and he would put the puppy eyes on and he'd sing <laughs> it to her and, and make her cry. You know, I'm Nobody's Child. So he had it because, you know, like um, Ringo says, one of his biggest influences is something like Frankie Lane. Mm-hmm. Um. But so all these people, I mean, Chet Atkins, you know, we mentioned just before, you know, when George was at, at school, one of the things he wanted to learn was how to play that picking style that Chet Atkins became famous for. Mm-hmm. He learned that at school, and that's why that's picked up all the way through the Beatles' career, that right. style, which still you can hear all the way through to the Wilburys, was that influence of, of Chet Atkins, who defined really the, the Nashville sound. Yeah. So, so it's all these different elements <laughs> coming together, and... That's why it's trying to understand the whole music scene in Liverpool mm. was such a melting pot. Yeah. And the Wilburys, I mean, what a, oh. what a country sound they have. Well, with absolutely. The, That's it. With the rockabilly mixed in. <laughs> Jeff Lynne loved that, too. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's all there. You can't argue with it. It's, it's great music. And I think that is in the end, when you come to examine the Beatles music, don't try and define it completely. Just you know, look for the influences in some songs. Right. But it's it's that genius of not being stuck in one genre, in one pigeonhole, mm. and, and one type of music. They well, took it all. Those are, those are the artists that I appreciate the most, that are not yeah. limited, you know? Absolutely. One more name I just want to mention to you is Slim Whitman, who you bring yes. up in the book. Yeah. How important was he to George? I know he's mentioned his name before. But what significance does he have in particular when it comes to George Harrison? Slim, I mean, I, I associate some of that with, uh, with Paul McCartney of seeing a left-handed guitarist. Um, but again, it, it, was the, it was the style. And of course, as we know, George, when he, if you see his school books, you know, he was drawing guitars over everything. And he was listening to anything that was different, any different style he could, he could find. And again, Slim was was huge over here. And again, he's one of those people that Phil Brady toured with as well. Mm-hmm. And he was he was just looking at a different guitar style. And I think George was just so obsessed with learning everything he could about playing guitar, from starting at simple stuff with Lonnie Donegan, but then going to complicated, complex uh, chess hacking stuff, mm-hmm. to going for simple country stuff, and then. Again, like Slim Whitman is like his own little bit of a genre w- within country itself, you know, with the yodeling style, which really you go back to uh, Jimmy Rogers, who's sort of the father of, of country music, uh, of that yodeling. And again, when you think of a yodeling style, that comes over from particularly Austria and Switzerland in Europe. So when you think of yodeling as a, as a country style of singing, that's a European uh, singing style. Hmm. So, so so again, <laughs> all, the, all the European roots are there in what became American country music. Right. Um, so yeah, so so Slim Whitman again, it, it's a different guitar style, and that's what George was always obsessed with. Why are they sounding different to somebody else? What are they doing that's different? One song I just want to bring up because I, I know I've, I think I've said this before on on a previous show, but um, one of George's songs. Rock and Share in Hawaii yes. was actually Hank Williams' Long Gone Lonesome Blues yep. with different lyrics. And George started working on that during the All Things Must Pass sessions. Mm. And um, later he just recorded a completely different song with different lyrics, but it's really the same song. Yep. So, um, and he might have also been influenced by, by Jimmy Rogers too with that song. So, yeah. And again, that's what we were saying before about blues. You know, a, a lot of the very early country songs were blues songs. That was Mule Skinner Blues. It's one of the most covered of country songs. Uh, it was a Jimmy Rogers original. Yeah. Just for every country artist has done it. Mm. But it's, it's, it's a blues song. A lot of Hank Williams stuff, when you, when you look through it, blues plays a big part of it. And a big part of country music 
they say, you know, if, if, if you didn't end up as a country musician, you'd still be married, you'd be sober, you'd have your house and your dog. Um, <laughs> and because you go off like, you know, the sad, sad story of, of people like Hank Williams, you know, who died, was he you know, 29 when he died? Mm. You know, he, his family life was terrible. He was just constantly driving around from gig to gig, um, alcohol, pills, um, everything like that. And, you know, that was him. What, what a waste of a life. Yeah. Uh, and that is a similar story with a lot of country musicians. It's the whole thing of you can only sing the blues when you've lived it. Well, a, a lot of them lived it. Hmm. And when it comes to Hank Williams, he's someone who, you know, I know his music more from other people covering it. And you'd be surprised how many people have, have done his songs. Because oh, yeah. you mentioned Move It On Over. I know George Thorogood. <laughs> I know yeah. his version of that. I've heard that, you know, so many more times than Hank Williams, sorry to say, to, yep. to fans of Hank Williams. <laughs> but uh, you'd be surprised. The average person knows probably more from Hank Williams than, they, than they're aware of. Absolutely right. Yeah, he's been covered by so many artists. And because when you listen to the songs that he was doing, it's not obviously, a lot of them aren't obvious country songs straight out. There is that stuff where you can hear the early rock and roll and it can easily fit into standard country, fit into a bit of rockabilly, fit into rock and roll. It's easy enough to do that because of the quality of the songs that he was writing. Absolutely. Darren, your turn. And uh, of course, film uh, filmmaker Tim Burton, uh, you mentioned Slim Whitman before. Um, Tim Burton revealed that... Uh, Slim Whitman's music can kill aliens. I don't know if you've seen the movie <laughs> Mars Attacks, David, but uh, when they would play Slim Whitman's Indian Love Call, uh, the aliens from Mars, his heads would explode, and that's how they. That's how they ended about up that. defeating, the ending the uh, in, uh, alien invasion on Earth with Slim Whitman's music. Over here, that um, happens with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh, stop it! <laughs> Ooh. I'm fine. He's uh, just jealous, Dave. Yeah, he loves uh, Alan loves Al, uh, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, Somebody David. has to. Somebody has to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, about midway through the conversation, you mentioned a second book. Are there plans of uh, doing a book, uh, a, a part two to the country of Liverpool? Yeah, absolutely. Because there's only so much I could cover. Because it was mainly, as I say, it started out being Phil Brady's biography. It then became setting the scene for that whole country. Uh, music scene from the 40s, 50s, 60s in particular. But I could only really touch on a few other artists apart from Phil. And there are so many bands and artists who were here and were active. And the interesting thing is, you know, we bring this right up to date that there um, are artists who, for example, there's uh, Siobhan Mar Kennedy. Now, she was in a Liverpool group in the 80s called River City People. Um, a fantastic album. She ended up moving to Nashville and she's lived out there for 30 years and has done uh, backing vocals and so on, on so many different songs. There is a big country revival and has been for a number of years over here. So there's so many other artists and up and coming ones in Liverpool still who are winning awards. Uh, the Americana Awards have just been on and someone who got a Lifetime Achievement Award was um, Elvis Costello. Now, again, you sort of associate Elvis Costello with the attractions, with that sort of punk style that, that he started off with, obviously the songwriting with Paul. But again, at the heart of his music has been growing up listening to country music. And, and so he, he did that album, um, Almost Blue, I believe is the name of it, was his country album. Yeah, absolutely. So th there are so many artists, and of course, Elvis Costello with, with his Liverpool connections. So th there are so many artists... <laughs> to try and cover. It was impossible to do it all in the first book. So the second book isn't going to be the uh, Beatles content. This will, this will be just looking at the, the other country musicians. So concentrating on the group, the Hillsiders, I mentioned before, who were the biggest country groups to come out of Liverpool. Just some amazing records, tours, stayed out in Nashville, recorded out there. And mm -hmm. really, it's... We've been tracking down so many musicians since this book, and the book only came out in December, that it started so many conversations with musicians saying, 
oh, well, I've, I've still got a load of photographs. And we think, wow. So we're going to try and collate all these, and that'll be uh, book two, Return to the Country of Liverpool. <laughs> I would imagine uh, that you, as a music fan, were turned on to an enormous amount of music that you might not have otherwise been familiar with before you started this book. Is that the case? And I've certainly discovered more. I think that the only music uh, my father and I had in common was Johnny Cash. He, he was off into Tijuana Brass and all, all kinds of terrible music my dad used to play. Um, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, really. I Wait love a Herb Alpert. <laughs> <laughs> Herb Alpert okay. is a hero of mine. He, he, and, and you're welcome to him. But when you've been tortured, I, I was stuck between listening to that and my sister playing ABBA. I, 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 had, I had a tortured childhood listening to that. But I, so I, I love listening to Johnny Cash. I always have done. But a lot of the the artists we say got the roots in country, like Buddy Holly and Carl Perkins and the Everly Brothers and people like that, I've been listening to. And a lot of that I discovered through being a Beatles fan, of finding out of the artists they liked and going and discovering them. So I've been a fan of that music. But going off and then listening to more, listening to a hell of a lot more of, uh, of Hank Williams and really appreciating what he did. But going and listen to, to the Carter family and to Jimmy Rogers uh, and then to Chet, Atkin, Chet Atkins and, and all these other artists, I'd, I've loved it. As you say, as a music fan, I love discovering more and more music. And good music is always going to be good music. And if I can find this is some of the music that defined Liverpool and the sound that came out in the 60s, I'm all for it. So I'm... It's a journey of discovery for me. I absolutely love it. It's been great fun. Any timetable for the return, uh, uh, the second book? Um, well, we've already started um, the first couple of interviews and tracking people down. And what we're going to do, because we're going to do a documentary film and we've just been putting the, the trailer together for that, obviously we've got to wait for some of the COVID restrictions to lift. But we want to get the Country of Liverpool documentary film out uh, as soon as we can and what we're going to do is combine interviewing people for the documentary film which will then gather the information for the book so you know most of that is going to be gathering that information during this year mm -hmm. um, so we're probably looking at, at, at sometime next year for book mm -hmm. number two okay good look forward to that yeah, yeah. absolutely Okay, that was uh, really sort of an enlightening look at uh, an aspect of uh, the Beatles and British music and Liverpool music that we often don't think about. And uh, I think we'll go around and give our contact information and uh, starting with Ken. Okay, you can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget every week there's Beatles trivia on there where you can win one of 10 great prizes, books, CDs, or DVDs. I also have a YouTube channel now, Ken Michaels Radio, and I'm starting to accumulate interviews on there, video interviews. Uh, most recently, I have a couple up with Gary Van Syok, the bass player from Elephant's Memory, talking about his time with John and Yoko. Uh, backing up uh, the Sometime in New York City album, Yoko's album, Approximately Infinite Universe, and uh, talking about the one-to-one -one concerts. I will have one more interview to do with Gary that will be up fairly soon. If you can, please subscribe to that at Ken Michaels Radio. And also I have my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next broadcast for that live, which will be the 22nd, of February, and uh, that's at nine o'clock on our Facebook page. Talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and we're going to be doing something called Four by Four. <laughs> Interesting title, but uh, we're picking four album cuts each from each of the four Beatles from the '70s that were not A sides to singles, and compiling an album of the best of the Beatles in the '70s and their solo careers that were not A sides to singles in the US and the UK. And then after that, the show will be available on all platforms, including our YouTube channel. So if you can, please subscribe to that. Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. I think that covers everything. Okay, Darren. 
All righty. Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, I have two Facebook pages. You could send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo or and or like Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. Uh, if you will send me a friend request, um, I'll send you an invitation then to the other page. Uh, if you want to email me, of course, you can contact me uh, on Facebook. If you want to send me an email, write me at WFUV. Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at W-F-U-V dot org. And W-F-U-V is spelled. I'm just kidding. Uh, and if you want to um, check me out on the radio, it's uh, New York City metropolitan area, 90.7 FM, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night and Thursdays, 10 p.m. to midnight. And on Saturday afternoons from one to four. Anywhere in the world, you can listen to WFUV.org and or download our app and listen there. And I think that just about covers me. Okay, David, you want to tell us um, how to get in contact with you, how to find the book, that kind of thing? Sure. You can go to the website, which is thecountryofliverpool.com. It tells you all about the book. Contact me there. Or I'm on Facebook as well. There's a Country of Liverpool Facebook page. Or you can find my uh, main website, which is Liddy Pool, which, of course, was my first book. So Liddy Pool, L-I-D-D-Y-P-O-O-L dot com. And that has links to my blogs um, and find out more about the books, etc. And you can contact me by email through uh, through there as well. Dot com is spelled C-O-M. Is that OK, Darren? <laughs> well, that's the uh, the British way of spelling it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, and to contact me, um, I've got two Facebook pages you can choose from. Um, one is just Alan Cozen. The other is Alan Cozen Remixed. We have a group page or two, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, and also Just Things We Said Today. From our point of view, the main one is the Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Uh, we post the shows on there and uh, you know you can comment or you also comment on uh the youtube and podbean pages uh please remember to subscribe to us on youtube if you haven't already uh and you can contact all of us at our group email which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's all one word I'll take a deep breath and say it again Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab. So, uh, with profound thanks to David Bedford uh, for coming along and chatting about the Yes. Good book. Pleasure. Thank you for having me, guys. So, um, I'm Alan Cozen, and for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, just saying good night, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.